Okay, well, welcome everybody to this uh, training session on learning how to identify some of the common grasses on Leicestershire verges. All of the grass species that we're going to cover tonight, or Russell's going to cover tonight, are uh, the common species or the most common species that we found during our surveys over the last couple of years of Leicestershire verges. So they're the ones that you're most likely to come across. Um, this is a, an introduction and will be followed up by a, a site meeting on Sunday. So hopefully if you're watching this live or you know, watching the recording in the next couple of days, you'll, you'll be able to come along and we'll meet there. The training sessions are being supported um, by Leicestershire County Council as part of their uh, Urban Wildlife Verges project. So I'm just going to hand over to Rosanna to say a few brief words about it. OK, thank you, David. Now, thanks everyone who's managed to join us this evening. And, and first and foremost, a big thank you to, to Russell and David um, for helping with the organisation and delivery of these. These are your experts. Um, I think I know everybody, but I know there's going to be people watching who don't know me. So just for that purpose, I'm Rosanna and I'm the Environmental Partnerships Officer on behalf of the County Council. So I've been with the council just over a year and I've taken on the responsibility of helping to sort of project manage um, our parish urban in Verge Wildlife Project. So you may have had a few communications from me here and there, and I will be out this Sunday on the field visit to meet a few people as well. So we hope you enjoy it. These are essentially for volunteers and the local community to help brush up your identification, your understanding and skills. And we hope then that you put that into practice in the field and get more actively involved with recording and monitoring. So by doing these free sessions, we hope that it provides a basis and a bit of, um, you know, a bit of your journey, if you like, on the way to recording so we hope you enjoy it and thanks again to everyone and over to you Russell. <laughs> thanks David. Thank you. Thanks Rosanna. Um, so here we go. Uh, grass is probably the most beautiful plant you will ever see. Um, now this uh, presentation is uh, not definitive but it's a guide to help you to understand how to look at, at grasses so that you can start to separate out the features that will help you with identification. Right, time to try and work out how to move on from this slide to the next one, which I can't do. Ah, good. Okay. Are you all good, Russell, or do you need? Yeah, yeah it's, all, yeah. it's all working now. Yeah. Technology, the joy. <laughs> I think I, I've just already said the uh, the things that these sentences say. So. OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, and perhaps this last bit is the most important. Um, selections of some of the features that I'm going to show you about grasses do apply to many other rarer species. So, uh, if you don't feel you're absolutely certain that you've got it right, please check carefully before you make a positive ID. And uh, if uh, in doubt, take photos of those special bits that I'm going to talk about and ask for a confirmation. The most important component of every meadow are the grasses. Beautiful things, aren't they? Just look at that. They're flowering plants, uh, but they are wind pollinated. They don't need to attract insects to do the pollinating, so their flowers can be very small, they can remain green, which is very efficient, and they're quite tightly packed together at the very top of the plant so that uh, it's easiest for the wind to uh, get to them and so that the seed eventually will be scattered far and wide. And each flower on a grass, uh, each fertile female flower, just contains a single ovule which will produce a single seed. Ah, now during this presentation I will, with the photographs, take put uh, the date as well. Uh, that's just to give you some idea because we do use the, um, the period of flowering to help with the identification. So this is quite an early uh, date for flowering grasses and the, the grass that you have there in front of you is meadow foxtail. 
um, and they're all meadow foxtail. Here's one that hasn't yet produced its anthers. Here's one with its anthers showing clearly, and here's one where the anthers are now finished doing their job. So that's another thing. You do have to get used to the grasses. Grasses looking a bit different depending on what stage they're at. Okay, so this is about helping you to um, be, be able to get used to the terminology. And uh, um, we're very lucky to have these nice illustrations by Lindsay Ann Heald. Thank you, Lindsay Ann. Okay, so here is the flowering stem of a grass. We call that the culm. And often, if it's a perennial grass, you will have with it a non-flowering stem, which we call the tiller. Now, if the culm is, if it's fairly robust grass and the culm base is flattened, and here's a cross section to so, show you what I mean. So we're looking at a, a cut through of the stem about there in the grass. It's even got little uh, wings on each side. Uh, and if the plant has a bluish or greyish tins, then that's typical of coxfoot. And there's uh, a picture of coxfoot. Uh, one of the special features of coxfoot, coxfoot is that the lowest branch, the one from the lowest node in the, in the inflorescence, is single. Just one branch at the lowest point. Now, I'm, I'm going to this talk is actually in two parts. We will see this one again when I do a sort of key through all the species, but this just helps to show you how you can use bits of the, the species to guide you in the right direction. Uh, 31st of May, yes, it's just now, Coxfoot is just now beginning to produce its uh, inflorescences. Um, this one is quite a useful one because the last year's inflorescences are still around and it's easy to identify even from those because the single branch is clear. Now we're going to talk about the leaf of a grass um, and this very important little bit here which is a membr membranous flap at the base of the leaf and at the top of the sheath is called the ligule. We use that a, a lot to help us with identification. Here's the blade of the leaf. Here is the sheath which encircles the stem or culm. And these little bits here around the base of the leaf, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. They're called oracles. Oh, it's gone back. No, it hasn't. Right. So now I'm going to talk about the ligules on this part of the plant, the tiller. Uh, and this is to show you how we can use the ligules. Here is the photograph, a photograph with a nice clear ligule. The, the Culm, the stem has been removed. And this is quite a short ligule, about as long as it is wide. Uh, and um, that's a means of distinguishing common bent, which is this grass not yet in flower, with creeping bent, which has a much longer than wide ligule. Well, that's how we might use ligule to distinguish one species from another. Uh, common bent and creeping bent. Let's have some dates. Yes, 28th of June, 23rd of July. This is one of the latest flowering grasses and it certainly isn't in flower yet. Okay. If the blade of the leaf is not flat as in this picture, but rolled around, then, and let's see if I can just, if, if it's instead of a flat leaf, it's 
a leaf which is rolled around itself into pretty well a cylinder. Then we have uh, one of the small fescues. I hope you can see in this photograph that these leaf blades are all rolled. If you cut through them, you get a circle as a cross section. And this is red fescue, um, quite a good uh, feature to identify red fescue. And that one is in flower at the moment. Now, if the blade on the other hand, this part is flat and softly downy, like that, with very short hairs all over the blade. It looks uh, almost whitish uh, because of the number of, of these tiny hairs. Uh, then you will have, could have Yorkshire fog. Um, it's just coming into flower now. There aren't many, but you can recognize it by this very grayish uh, and, and very softly downy leaf and stem. Also, if the ling ligule is longer than wide, it can help you distinguish the meadow grasses, rough meadow grass and a short, shorter than wide ligule for smooth meadow grass. These are just into flower now. Um, and uh, I'm not sure where this is, but the, the, these can also be uh, distinguished. Uh, their name gives the game away, but it, with rough meadow grass here, um, if this is the lower sheath of the grass, when you gently move it against your lips, you can feel the bristles poking into your lips when you move it in one direction, up the stem. Whereas if it's the smooth, meadow grass, you don't feel that it's smooth in both directions. So there's two ways of distinguishing between those two species. And there it is. Here's the, here's the uh, thing that I'm just talking about. Smooth meadow grass and rough meadow grass. As you can see, the inflorescence is fairly difficult to distinguish between the two, but with the ligule and the and the, the roughness or smoothness of the sheath, you will be able to tell the difference between them. They're in flower now. Now we're moving on to the, uh, that was the vegetative parts of the grass. Now we're moving on to the, uh, the, the inflorescence, the flowering part, which is at the top of the culm. And we have a central uh, part of the culm called the rachis once it's up in the inflorescence. And then we have a spikelet, which is one unit of the inflorescence. This whole area here is a spikelet. And in some, within the spikelet, we often have more than one flower. Each one's called a floret. There's a flower, there's another, 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 another. So spikelets often usually contain more than one uh, floret or flower. Sometimes they just have one. Um, and the at flowers, actually some of them have a bristle which projects beyond the tip, the tip of the, the flower or the floret. We call that an awn. Okay, now, so there's a, a few of the terms, and now we're going to go through a sort of a, a key to try to help you to be able to work out the species as you're looking at it in the field. Um, and we're going to start with the inflorescence as a simple spike, uh, with the spikelets having no or some very short stalks and they'll look like this sort of thing that's that's a whole uh, inflorescence no branches on the spikelets so that it just looks like a cylinder that's timothy which is not yet in flower and 
you could also have a, a simple spiglet, which also looks a bit like a pointing finger, but you can see the spikelets, the individual spikelets on each alternating on each side of the culm or rachis, and that's perennial ryegrass. They're not really in flower yet, but these are, these are now um, easy to find. Okay, so here's a pointing finger grass, meadow foxtail. Uh, you saw that earlier on in the presentation. And um, the point about this slide is that meadow foxtail, the uh, spikelets come to an awn. They end in a single awn. Each spikelet has one awn. So they come, the, uh, the, the spikelet comes to a point and then it's extended by the awn. Whereas this, which is also a pointing finger type grass, Timothy, here's a close up of the uh, spike. And you'll see that each of these inflorescences actually has a pair of horns, like little devil's horns. And that's a, a good way of distinguishing between the two. Uh, once again, we've got May grasses, and this one is very much later grass, a grass in, into June. Okay. Now, uh, also, uh, a pointing finger type grass, but all the spikelets are on one side of the stem. Um, and there's a nice picture showing that. Not quite so obvious here, but you can just see that there's a, the bare st uh, st rachis is visible down one side, and that is crested dog's tail. And here, I've decided to try and distinguish it by saying that the spike, although it's a pointing finger, has a rather oval shape to it. It starts narrow, swells nicely, and then goes back to a point at the other end. This is sweet vernal grass. Um, I think the other thing about sweet vernal grass that helps me spot it easily is that each spikelet is quite large and distinct whereas with some of these other pointing fingers they're so close together that uh, they're hard to separate when you're when you're looking at them with a the naked eye. A little extra um, help for you to identify the sweet vernal grass these lovely ciliate uh, bases to the leaves with these little hairs projecting from them. Okay, uh, yes, this one is, is flowering now, and so is this one. This is really quite an early grass, this one, the uh, sweet vernal grass. Okay, and this is the final pointing finger type, one with really long horns something that's uh, really noticeably long, and that's a barley. Okay, that's in flower now, although those dates are later, it's well in flower now too. Okay, and here's our uh, pointing finger type grass with, but with the uh, alternating spikelets on it, easily to see that they're alternating as you go up the culm, that's perennial rye grass. Uh, there is another, which is not yet in flower, common cooch. Yes, July, that one, yes. Uh, but there is, a, there is a difference, and I think it's on the next slide. No, it isn't, so I'm gonna to have to go back. There is a special difference, and that is the spikelets on perennial ryegrass are, and again, I'm gonna to have to just get that up. If that is the stem, my arm is the stem. I don't know if you can see that in the picture, I hope you can. Then the spikelet is sideways on to the stem in perennial ryegrass. In um, common cooch, if that's the stem, the spikelet 
is face side of flatways onto the stem. I hope you can see that in the picture. So yes, it shows quite nicely that the flat side of the spikelet faces the stem. That's a good way of distinguishing between the two. Okay, so that's, that's our, the end of our pointing finger uh, species. And now we're coming on to species which have clear branches on the inflorescence, some, something you can actually see clearly. And I'm dividing them into two sections, these. I'm gonna start with the florets that don't have any orms at the tip. And then I'm going up, that's annual meadow grass. And then I'm going to have a look at uh, florets that do have orms projecting uh, from the tip of the floret. And that's false oak grass. Here we go, dates again. Uh, oh, I have to go back and then do that one again. Sorry. Where's those dates gone? There we are. Okay. So yes, the, the meadow grass, this annual meadow grass is in flower more or less 12 months of the year, actually. Um, and do we have a date for the false oak grass? Oh, I didn't see that. Okay. Okay. So here we go with the branched inflorescence. Um, but this is a special note that is sometimes when the, at different phases in the flowering, sometimes, although the inflorescence is branched, they close up to the stem. So it, <laughs> at first sight, it would appear that the branches can't be seen. They can, all you have to do is just gently hold the, the spike and tease the florets apart and you'll see the spikes easily. So here's how we're going to proceed. We've got clear branches, we've got florets without awns, and to start with, we're going to look at the species that have only one floret in a spikelet. And those are the bents, uh, which we've seen already in terms of ligule length. And we're going to have another look at them. There's common bent, which has tiny spikelets uh, because there's only one floret in each one. Um, and they are very open. Common bend is a very open, so it's a very delicate looking grass and it, the, the spikelets are clearly visible separately. Whereas with creeping bent, they are tend to be clustered together a little bit more and at certain stages it, with creeping bent, especially when it's finished flowering, the, it closes up, the branches come up to the rachis and again, it almost looks like a pointing finger. Okay. And just to remind you, as we saw earlier, for common bent, the tiller ligule is shorter than wide. And on creeping bent, the tiller ligule is longer than wide. 3rd of July for, for the uh, common bent, 27th of July, even later, 23rd of July for the creeping bent. This species is not in flower yet. Okay, now still without awns, but with more florets in each spikelet, we have meadow grasses. And here's a nice indication. You can see that each spikelet has a number of florets in it, uh, but absolutely no awns, they're quite rounded um, spikelets. Uh, meadow grass, this is annual meadow grass, it flowers throughout the year uh, and the way to pick this one out is to notice that it has only one or two branches at its very lowest uh, junction, the lowest whirl of branches has only one or two branches. Whereas smooth meadow grass, as you can see, one, two, three, there's at least four um, branches to the lowest whirl. And uh, we have a ligule which is shorter than wide. Whereas <laughs> with rough meadow grass, we have a ligule which is much longer than wide. 
And you remember the lip test as well for those. Um, and these are in flower now. Okay, so that's uh, florets without horns. Now we'll look at, at species that have horns on their florets. And we start with horns which are long, as long or longer than their florets. And this first sheet has more than five florets in each spike. Now this species, which is soft brome, the spikelet is longer than its branch, than its, than its, um, yeah, its pedicel. Okay, you can see that, that's nice. So each individual spikelet has a relatively short branch, that's soft brome. Uh, it's so called because actually when you look at it very closely and feel it with your fingers, you'll see just like that Yorkshire fog with the, uh, with the white, short white hairs, uh, it feels soft to the touch. And if the spikelet on the other hand is shorter than its branch, <laughs> okay, much longer branch and the spikelet not quite as long, then you have barren brome. These are in flower now. Oh, that's a late one, but we'll find those in flower on Sunday. And here we've got horns oh, still longer than the florets, but now we have fewer than five florets per spikelet. Or oh, perhaps I should perhaps go back and just uh, show you that let's just here we are look so here are the florets that you can you can work out look there's one two three four five six seven i suppose each one of those little uh, leaf-like organs with this with a horn coming from it re represents a, a single floret or flower so we have more than five there i'll have to just flick through these but these have fewer than five florets in the spikelet. Um, and this is false oat grass. Uh, you still see a long horn, but I think you can make out from this picture just two or maybe three um, florets per spikelet, usually two. And um, this is an, another a much rarer grass, uh, yellow oat grass, uh, similar looking, uh, but notice the name yellow. Uh, it does look uh, a, a lot yellower green than this one. And look at the horns coming, more than one horn per spikelet. Okay, here's another couple of pictures of the same species. Here's false oat grass with its um, single horn coming from each spikelet. And here's the yellow oak grass, perhaps showing the color a little bit as well, the fact that it's a yellow or green. Okay, and then there's our final uh, little section here with the horns which are shorter than the florets. And this is the plant which we saw earlier with the softly downy leaves. This is Yorkshire fog. The horns are tiny compared with the ones that we've seen. And we have a, a leaf and a stem which is very beautifully downy. This is just coming into flower now. And here's another with tiny uh, horns just about see them there. Uh, this is Coxfoot. Uh, the horns are not obvious always in this, but remember that Coxfoot feature, a single branch at its lowest whirl, which is a real giveaway. Lovely, nice and clear. Okay, and this is going back to our, almost our first slide which, with the rolled leaves. Uh, this does have 
uh, little tiny awns from the florets, uh, but the leaves are rolled and bristle like, and this is red fescue. Okay. And finally, I have a question for you. I have uh, some photographs of something that looks rather like a grass, except that it's covered in very long hairs, white hairs. And its flower, well, it's like a, a very small flower with petals or tepals and anthers, lots of anthers and a central stigma look as well. Okay, so I'm asking, is this a grass? What do you think? I'll, I don't pass, hear... that. I'll pass that to one of the two ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say no. Yeah, you're spot on. Do you know what it is? No, I don't. Okay. This is, is it, um, go on. Is it a sage? Uh, no, it's not a sage. It's a wood rush. Oh. It's a wood rush. It's field wood rush. And when, if you find this, um, and it's more or less finished now for the year, so you need to get, get out on those verges early. If you find this, in your verge, then you've really got quite a special place because this uh, this species can't survive once there's too much nitrogen or too much ploughing or anything like that. So this is field woodrush, beautiful thing. There we are, 11th of February and the 16th of April for the flowers. Okay, so um, I've. I think, Dave, I think you have this as well. And this is something we will be able to use on Sunday and try it out. Uh, it's a kind of a, a table that helps you get to the right species. You have to start with your, each time with your specimen um, on the left hand side, and then you go through the little and find the appropriate um, answer to these selections. And if you, be patient with it and keep going. You will come up with one of these species which we've looked at today. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, now, uh, yes, just a, a, a tiny thing, which uh, again, if you're coming on Sunday, it really would be useful to you. You will find it easier if you have some kind of magnification available. Don't have to be too specific about it, but some of these features are quite hard to see with the naked eye. A lens can make it much easier. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Nature Spot and Leicestershire County Council for um, making this idea possible to because I think it, it will encourage us to look at verges more closely and I uh, also like to thank Lindsay and Heald for the uh, earlier diagrams which has made it easier for me to explain. Uh, that's as far as I go I think now Dave would you like me to ask are, are there any questions at this stage? Yeah, well, if anybody has any questions by all means um, unmute yourself and, 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 and ask them. And I just wanted to say thank you again, Russell. That was really, really informative. And I know I enjoyed it as well. I don't get to go out much anymore in the field, so it's always <laughs> nice to, so, you know, I'm looking forward to Sunday and uh, seeing yeah. everyone. <laughs> Brilliant. Parking okay. could be easy on Sunday. It should be easy and we, we will start in the car park. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. That, that's that's brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Russell. That was really good. Yeah, we'll thanks. we'll send out the links to the uh, recorded version of this, and we'll also send out links or, or send out the, the the little key that you put up to to everybody. Yeah. They can bring along on Sunday or try out beforehand, um, and hopefully put some of what you've taught us into practice. Yeah. Yeah, it's looking to be a busy day, actually. I think grass ideas proved to be one of the more popular ones. I mean, all of them are great. Oh, okay. but I think mm. fact, I've just double looked. We've got 15 people booked, which oh, will wow. happen at around 12. But Brilliant. we do make an exception that there may be a couple of people that might not show. So yeah. we'll okay. see. But hopefully it'll be a good turnout. Lots okay. of interest anyway. And